This sermon has had three titles. The one we gave it when we started the series, the one that's printed in your bulletin, and the one that I dreamed up yesterday. It just didn't seem like I could get a fix on exactly what I wanted to say until say, later on in uh, the afternoon yesterday, and suddenly it went bing like that. So here's the third version of the first sermon. Are you ready? Okay. Today's story that we read in that long passage in chapter 43 is really an amazing true life account of grace. Um, earlier before the service started, Anne came to me and said, I heard that you didn't want me to read the whole thing. And I said, no, you've got to read the whole thing. And she said, good, because it's a great story. <laughs> so that amazing story of grace talks about extreme favor, surprising, undeserved, and really kind of mysterious. So if you're a bit of a detective this morning, aren't you glad you're here? Because there's a mystery to be solved. Uh, let's look at that passage. And Joseph lifted up his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, is this your youngest brother of whom you spoke to me? And here are the key words. God be gracious to you, my son. Think about those words just for a second. Then Joseph hurried out for his compassion grew warm for his brother. And he sought a place to weep and he entered his chamber and wept there. This is the second most powerful person in the kingdom of Egypt. This is the person who by his savvy stewardship has risen to be just under the king. When you're in that kind of a position, you better be successful. Because your head is on the line, probably quite literally. So here's this beautiful passage, and you can see in the picture that's up on the screen that Joseph is dressed quite differently than the brothers who are, what? Bowing down to him. Where have we heard that before? And one little guy, Benjamin, who's standing. Now, Benjamin's important because his name means the right hand. And anyone who sits at the right hand of somebody important is just about as powerful as they are. So the right hand, who's pointing with his left, is pointing to the right hand who's standing before him. An interesting irony, which we'll kind of uncover a little bit later. This development is really quite remarkable. Grace is at work here in a mysterious way, doing its best to confound us with peaks and valleys. And whenever I think of peaks and valleys, I think of roller coasters. Mm -hmm. Now, you really never thought of your life as peaks and valleys, did you? You don't have ups and downs. You do. Okay, the honest ones are nodding, and the rest are looking at me like, I'm not going to say a word. <laughs> well, think about the ups and downs in this story. Now, first you have the special son. Now, that's Joseph in this particular case, who is now in Egypt, the second in command. Now, now that seems to be kind of a high honor, doesn't it? Until he becomes the slaughtered slave. He wasn't really slaughtered, but his brothers made it look as though a wild animal had killed him. But they really sold him into slavery. And then another peak happens. He becomes a successful steward in the house of Potiphar. That's a good job, if you can get it. Until Potiphar's wife, who's anxious to get it on with Joseph, tries to seduce him, and yet he still, even though he ends up with prison because, in prison because of this, still remains savvy. He kind of takes over the prison. Then something interesting happens. A dream is had by two people in the prison, and he becomes the only person who can see quite clearly what the wisdom of the dreams are going to be. He tells a baker and a cupbearer what their fortunes will be. That seems like a good thing until 
he becomes the slighted savior, they forget all about him. Oh yeah, I'll remember you. You've never had that happen, right? Oh yeah, I'll put you up for that promotion, which never ever comes. Yeah, I'll get you a new car, which never ever shows up in the driveway. And then what happens? And then another opportunity comes up and he becomes the second sovereign in the nation. Grace has its ups and downs. It follows life. But look, as it continues, he's still that second sovereign. Is he about to become the savage sentinel? Savage meaning he's going to make his brothers pay for what they did. He's going to make them abide by all the rules as the sentinel in Egypt. The double whammy. What's he going to be? In the ups and downs of grace, in the ups and downs of life, sometimes you're not really sure. But this story is really a marvel of grace when you think about it. As Joseph, the favorite son of his father, Jacob or Israel, adopts Benjamin as my son. Imagine yourself standing there knowing all of this history, seeing little Benjamin, who's now the favorite of Israel, thinking, I could have been my dad's favorite. Well, I, I was my dad's favorite until they lied about me and they sold me as a slave and they told my dad I died. I could have been the favorite. But he stands there and adopts Benjamin as my son. These words in Hebrew are not just my son, like going to somebody and saying, hey, you're a great guy. My son. No, this is a heartfelt, deeply, deeply moving kind of compassion. You're my son. Or maybe you're the one the only one that could have taken my place. He's so overwhelmed with what happens that he has to withdraw. He goes to another room and dehydrates. If you've ever let your kid go to college, <laughs> what happens when you leave him or her there? You dehydrate. In fact, when I was talking to Keith last night, I said, are you dehydrated or are you okay? And the answer didn't come back very quick. It was sort of like, I'm okay. That's what happens when grace is in your life and you're, you're full of grace with all your heart. The meaning of grace, this word in this chapter in Genesis is the word kana to bend or stoop in kindness to an inferior, to long or to yearn for someone. And it really denotes four things, which are almost identical in the New Testament. It indicates salvation or saving. Uh, actually, Joseph is saving the life of his brothers and especially little Benjamin and, and his dad and mom. It means forgiving. Could you forgive what Joseph forgave? If all of that was done to you, could you do it? Oh, wait, let's make it really personal. Who haven't you forgiven? Who's there right now, as I said those words? Who's in the back of your mind? Who do you know you should have called? A long time ago, forget. Is that enough introspection for Sunday morning? Thanksgiving. Think of Joseph. Thankful for all the things that happened to him. Through all those ups and downs. Through all those tests and trials. 
He could have become angry and bitter. He could not have arised to the occasion so many times, and his life history would have been so different. And by the way, the life history of all the people around him. But he had grace and was grateful for what God had done in his life. He learned how to transform that grace into service. He was really the ultimate server. I think I told you last week that until around the 1940s, the reforms that Joseph brought to North Africa because of the, the, the agricultural uniquenesses of that part of the world, those reforms lasted for thousands of years. It's a mystery that Joseph is so abysmally treated by his brothers that he should find grace enough where? Read it. Where does he find the grace? In his heart. In his heart. To save, forgive, and be thankful for, and serve them with, not just in, but serve with all of his heart. How do you serve? We many times talk about grace, and we want to believe it's there, but do we let it out? Do we let it escape? Do we let it bless people around us? This is what happened in that larger picture. All those brothers bowing down to the second sovereign in the land of Egypt. And rather than bring vengeance on their sorry souls, he forgives them. And the dream comes true. That dream that made them so angry now fills them with grace. Because if Joseph had not been there, they would not be alive. Remember that little part of the passage that says, Egyptians don't eat with Hebrews because that's an abomination. They'd be dead. Think of the moment in Joseph's mind when all of this comes to his remembrance. But folks, at Grace, we know Grace. We've been through ups and downs. We've been through difficulties. I've lost track of the number of buildings that I've led a service in, in the last eight years. But that's the window I remember most of all, because the shepherd who's led and guided us has filled us full of grace. And while that window is not here, built into the walls, it's here up on the screens. It's stuck in our memories. It's what's important to us because we understand that were it not for the grace of the shepherd, we could not be where we are right now. We've had a grace coaster in our past. We started in 1883. Now this is a little history lesson for those of you who are newer. We were Grace Episcopal Mission. Right on 101 Pacific Coast Highway where there's a liquor store right now. Two buildings were built on that site. But what happened? Well, they became too small. So I understand, and I, I would love to have a picture of this if any of you have it. They picked the church up off of its foundation, put it on some sort of conveyance, and moved it about eight blocks down the street to a larger space so that we could continue to grow. And that's exactly what we did. We grew through all the ups and downs. But then what happened? Physical challenges. And I'm really sandwiching the, or scrunching the history down. So what do you do when you have Episcopal challenges? Well, you form something that's Episcopal, but you keep being Orthodox. You keep faithful to Scripture and to the Spirit. And you don't let other people's lack of grace change your heart. So 
we lose a building. We actually lost it twice. And we marched to this place twice. But did we really lose a building or did we regain our mission? In regaining the mission, we had a COVID challenge for almost three years. And then a transition again. But is that going to send us down? No. It's going to keep us going forward, moving up. I can almost hear the strains of, there's a place for us, a time and place for us. Can you sing it with me? We'll find it. It's there. And ultimately, there will be a permanent home. And the leadership is in place to make that happen. Someone said to me when we left Grace the second time, you know what? This is a building. It's not the church. We are. We are the church. And that makes all the difference. And our ministry, in our, in our new purpose statement, is, is going to be done in an ocean of God's grace. Bending or stooping in kindness, as Jesus does, for our community. Longing for and yearning to live out the saving, forgiving, thanksgiving, and serving love of God in Christ. By the peace, presence, and power of the Holy Spirit. Now, I didn't give you deliberately the new purpose statement because I think that belongs to the next steps. I want you to know that that ocean of grace is not only in our hearts, but can be manifest with all of our hearts. I want to bring the other two passages in as I close this morning. Um, you know, David was a mentor of grace. Here's part of the passage. Blessed are we, chosen and brought near to dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house and the holiness of your temple. Where are the grace words? Right there, all in yellow. Blessed means you've already received the grace of God. Chosen and brought near. Is that not amazing to be brought near to God? Chosen by him? Goodness? is that Hebrew concept of grace and holiness is very close to it, yet stands above it. Jesus is also a mentor on grace. Uh, look at the passage sort of slightly scrunched together. A sower went out to sow. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some 60, some 30. He who has ears, let him hear. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, in another thirty. What's your grace factor this morning? How much grace do you have? How much grace do you think God has to take us into the future? A hundredfold? Sixty? 30, what's your stock portfolio? Would you be happy with a hundredfold on your investment or 60 or 30? Shouldn't we rejoice more when God gives us a hundredfold? 60, 30, or read it backwards, 30, 60, 100 fold. That's what we pray God is gonna do. And where's the grace here? Well, here are all the grace words. It starts with the sower. God, by the Holy Spirit, sows graciously into our lives. And what else happens? Increase, because good soil is producing it. You hear the word, you understand it. It bears fruit and yields that incredible harvest of grace. Now, I don't know if you noticed this morning, but there are less people in church than are on the beach. Do you know what that means for us? Job security. We have the opportunity to take this message 
to others. It's countercultural. We'd much rather be out there having fun, especially in the land that the Beach Boys sang about all the time. But this is true fun. This is going to get us through earth to heaven. The grace of God is what is going to do that. So, Rose and I just want to say thank you. Now, I could pick out the folks who are, who have been senior wardens here, some of whom I coaxed at least on one occasion to stay one more year. Um, junior wardens, all of those things. But you know what I want to say? I want to say thanks to the team that is Grace. You're all an integral part of what God is doing in this life and ministry of this church. I could say thanks to the best woman priest I know who sits right here and probably was appalled at the way I did my first communion at Grace. She's chuckling. And she's not saying a word, which is so wise. <laughs> because I didn't do all the same things that she did. And I didn't think the same way about all the things that she thought. And on one occasion, when we were sitting in a room together, I said, remember, I'm the only Anglican here. Because I studied in an Anglican school and she studied in Episcopal school. <laughs> and we were joking, of course. But we have such a friendship, we can hardly get off the phone when we start talking to one another. And I could talk about all the folks who serve on staff, clergy, not the least of which is my subdeacon brother over here, <laughs> with whom I not only have the privilege to share the goodness of God, who is now also a chaplain. But I have the opportunity to lose golf balls with. <laughs> God has been so good and has provided a wonderful brother, a wonderful brother, for the next phase of our church's ministry. So, thank you, Grace. You have truly been Grace. And guess what? You will always be grace. If you take this message of Joseph and his grace and David and his grace and Jesus and his grace and multiply it a hundredfold, sixtyfold, thirtyfold, this area will be a great place because of grace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the privilege that we have to look into your work. What a wonder it is. Thank you for grace. Thank you for the minister who saw the need in a growing part of the world back in the 1880s. Thank you for ministers who faithfully, all the way through the history of this church, have seen that grace at work. Thank you for the congregations that have gathered. Thank you that they've paid attention to stories like Joseph and his grace, David and the grace that he talks about in his relationship with God and Jesus. Jesus' grace that saves us. Thank you for all that you've done in our lives. Lord, this morning, we give you a hand clap. I'm still clapping. It's for the Lord. Why are you seated? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. 
Thank you. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Amen.